um, Miss Penny, could you introduce yourself um, to the audience? So my name is Carol Penny, and um, I have had a wonderful career as a kinder music educator, trainer, the director of education for Kinder Music International. So music for very young children is my passion. Didn't start out that way. I'll tell you more about that, but it became that. And I believe that the biggest difference I can make um, for the future is by using music appropriately for very mm -hmm. young children and their parents. Okay, great, thank you. So the first question is, how did you first become introduced to the world of music? Where did the love for music first start? Well, my father was a musician. Mm -hmm. um, he was a freelance musician in New York City um, back in the, you know, 40s, 50s. Yeah. Um, he was a trumpet player. He was a <laughs> conductor. He was an arranger. He was a composer. He wrote over 4,000 jingles for commercials. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. The most famous one being the Maxwell House coffee pot commercial. Do, do, do. Which you probably don't recognize, but maybe some of the older listeners do. But anyway, um, I was the second child. Mm -hmm. So as the second child, um, I wanted to do everything I could to get my father's attention. Oh, <laughs> and music was that thing. Yeah. And so at five, he started me on piano. And then when I was in elementary school, I took clarinet. So um, those were my two main instruments. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sad or embarrassed to say that I did all this to please my father. <laughs> and that became the joy of my life. That's wonderful that that started out as your childhood and you grew to love it so much. Right. Okay, so now that you've established which instruments you play, um, can you describe your role in the development of the Kinder Music Organization? So when I was first introduced to Kinder Music, it had just come to this country from Germany. And just a little bit of history, in Germany, Community music schools were free and um, available to anybody, could go take music lessons. And they, um, back in the, oh, I guess, 70s, were discovering that it was tricky putting these little, um, albeit very musical, three and four year olds, because what toddler isn't musical, like mm -hmm. 100% of them, um, they weren't thriving sitting on the bench at the piano, right. which is all we knew back then Yeah, to teach them piano. So they worked with a team of experts to develop a curriculum that um, would be a little more appropriate. It would have, it did include some movement and some other things um, for young children that are, were away from the bench. Mm -hmm. So they could do some things in preparation for sitting at the bench and playing piano. Um, so that was the beginning of kinder music in Germany. And then it was brought to this country. I was fortunate enough to be around when it was just being established in Winston-Salem, which was the second place in the United States where they opened a kinder music program. Mm -hmm. And um, I got involved there teaching and I'll come back to how I was open to working with preschoolers at that time, but very fortunate to be in this place where kinder music was kind of brand new um, in this country. So I began as a teacher, um, teaching for this kinder music program. Um, and then I moved to Charlotte and started another program down in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And then during this time I served as a trainer 
to train other teachers to become kinder music educators. And I did that for um, what became Kinder Music International, the corporate office overseeing the curricula development and the training. Um, I joined Kinder Music in the 90s. I had been selling ORF instruments mm -hmm. and other percussion instruments, and they um, hired me to come do that for Kinder Music. And I continued as a trainer, going out and training other educators. Then I got involved in curriculum development. And then I became the director of education. So that's sort of my evolution at Kinder Music International. That's amazing that you were there during like the origins of Kinder Music in the United States. And yes. It's amazing. Okay. It was my pleasure and honor. And in looking back, I don't think I realized at the time how significant that was going to be for my life. But yeah. now in looking back, I was definitely in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so now could you talk a little bit about your educational background and what experiences led you um, to work with children, specifically in children's music education? Sure, I started um, when I was about three or four or five teaching in the basement I had my parents had gotten me a blackboard mm -hmm. I was a teacher I mean out of the womb it was just something I loved to do I would practice teaching no one of course <laughs> but had my little blackboard and mm -hmm. that's, that was the appropriate the the only way we wrote there were no whiteboards, there were no um, screens or anything else, of course, back then. But I would go down in the basement and I would teach my pretend class. So I think I've always came into this world knowing that teaching was what I wanted to do, even though I didn't know it at the time. It's, it's something that just fit. I've taught yeah. lots of things. I taught yoga. I... <laughs> I, I love to teach. Mm -hmm. um, I also love music. And, you know, we talked about that a little bit. Um, so my first job out of college, I was a music education major, um, was in a middle school. Mm -hmm. So that's a little <laughs> bit challenging. And not yeah. only that, I was in a middle school where I got all the students who weren't in band, orchestra, or chorus. I see. I got general music. Mm -hmm. That means the kids who didn't like music. And I had a great year. I sort of burned myself out oh, trying wow. to instill a love of music in these children. And I kept wondering, what is it that could have come before they were in seventh grade or eighth grade? What could their experience of have been to make them love music instead of resist music mm -hmm. for those who weren't already drawn to it through band, chorus, or orchestra. So I got very involved with the ORF approach to music education, which I think is just phenomenal, a wonderful hands-on um, uh, approach. And so I did that for a long time, teaching ORF to elementary school children. Well, then I had children of my own. And of course, when you, you um, go to their preschool and you say, yes, I'm, I'm a music teacher, they said, oh, well, come do music with our kids. And I, of course, took all my ORF stuff and I was like, this doesn't work with preschoolers. Oh. I began to learn the children in elementary school, like seven and up, learn in a different way than preschoolers learn. Mm -hmm. So I was very curious about what the difference is and why the ORF approach, which is very linear, wasn't working with these three and four-year-olds. And that, coincidentally, is when I bumped into kinder music. So that's kind of how I came, what my background was before I stepped in to the kinder music arena. 
Okay, very cool. Um, kind of as a follow up question, um, how is ORF um, different than Kinder Music, or could you explain a little bit what the ORF, what the ORF um, theories are? A lot going on in the 40s and 50s in music education. There was Carl Orff, there was uh, Zoltan Kadai, there was Dal Crows, there was Laban, all these people who are working with young children with movement and music. Mm -hmm. Carl Orff created um, these instruments where you could take xylophones, metallophones, glockenspiels, where you could ensure success. Now, think about it for a minute. Putting a child at a keyboard requires that they their digits move independently, that they can read music. Mm -hmm. A violin requires very fine motor coordination. Yes. This hand does one thing and this hand does another. Any instrument, a clarinet, oh my goodness, you have to be a lot older to be able to work on the muscles here mm -hmm. and then the finger dexterity here. So all of these take older children, but we keep seeing that these youngsters are very musical. What can we do to help them create beautiful music, which we have to say, the squawking on a clarinet is not particularly beautiful at first, right? right? So how can we make beautiful music? So Karl Orff came up with an, an approach that um, uses all these beautiful instruments where you can remove the bars so all they can play is the notes that are correct for whatever your composition you're put, pulling together. Um, you do a lot of work in pentatonic in the early stages before you know, before they can hear chord changes and things like that. So it gives them a lot of success and they create beautiful music. The important thing about the ORF approach is that it is the process that's important, not mm -hmm. the performance. And I will tell you, learning that really paved the way for who I became as a music educator, even though I landed with younger ages where this approach doesn't work mm -hmm. as the same as it does with elementary children. I really understand and understood and put into practice its process, not performance for young children that's important. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, okay. So the next question is, how has the Kinder Music organization evolved and changed over the past few decades since its founding? So when it came to this country, of course, it was a pre-keyboard experience. Mm -hmm. They were experiencing difficulty with the children on the bench at the keyboard, finding that that was not the best experience for them. So they added some movement and things like that, but it was still a pre-keyboard experience. Yeah. Um, kinder music, as it evolved, and we've been around for 40 years plus, um, as it evolved, we came from being um, a music prep curriculum to a child development curriculum. Um, okay. Let me read this quote um, from Cheryl Lavender. The fact that children can make beautiful music is less significant than the fact that music can make beautiful children. So the shift became teaching children to become musical to using music as the vehicle for the development of the whole child, the cognitive, physical, social, and emotional child. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, and so the next question is, how has your role in the organization changed and did your career path surprise you in any way? So I'm retired now. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest surprise for me is that at 73, I'm still teaching. 
<laughs> Who says at 73, you want to be still working at your mm -hmm. job? I do. And I, I just love it. I love, and it brings me the same joy as it has over four decades, five decades of, of teaching. Um, the other thing that was a big surprise for me, of course, I started with teaching children and then mm -hmm. my career moved on and I um, became a trainer for kinder music. And then I moved on from that and um, did curriculum development, as I said before, and then eventually became the director of education. So I got to interface with lots of wonderful educators like Lindsay. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that was a surprise to me that I enjoyed working with the teachers as much, if not more than I enjoyed working with the children and their parents. Mm -hmm. um, so that has been just a real blessing for me is getting to know all the wonderful um, educators all around the world. That's amazing. Yeah, it's so nice that you're able to enjoy your career and not get burnt out teaching, but to truly um, love it. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is, um, so you're the, you were the director of education for Kinder Music. How did your experiences or like beliefs about children shape your development of Kinder Music curriculum and practices? Well, I had some very influential teachers as I'm understanding you have also yes. that make a difference in your life and they help mold and form your, your your thought processes and your outlooks. Um, it was the ORF teachers who taught me the importance of process over performance. I was, you know, all as a clarinet major, performance was very important, but I was, I don't thrive on performance. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of performance anxiety. It wasn't it didn't bring me great joy. It made me a, a wreck, yeah. right? Um, but as I said, starting at five, I love teaching in my basement. So <laughs> it was perfect for me to go on to, to teaching. And when I found the ORF approach, which embraced the process, not the performance, that really spoke to me in terms of my journey. Then I had a very influential Montessori teacher and she would say to us, the big R, and back then we would say the three R's are reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, hopefully that is <laughs> many more important things than those three, but that was a saying back then, but she mm -hmm. would say the big R is respect. And that just was a mindset that I took on respecting the child. And it led me to a study of child development. Um, and I realized the best teachers for me were the children themselves. Okay. And those were the most influential um, parts of my training and my outlook on what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so by learning from the children and respecting them and their ideas, you were able to like shape the curriculum to what they needed and what they could grow from? Sure. So, so it was really important that I learned about children. Mm -hmm. I signed up for courses to learn about child development, to know, understand what was developmentally appropriate at each age. Mm -hmm. uh, an example, you don't walk into a class of two-year-olds and ask them to hop. They don't hop yet. You need to know that. You need to know what is developmentally appropriate, both physically, cognitively, socially, emotionally, and musically. And so that kind of preparation and study is, is critical. Um, as a teacher, I would say the most important thing you can do is prepare. Mm -hmm. 
just because they're little doesn't mean you can go in and sort of wing it, right? Yeah. You have to be over prepared because you never know where they're going to be on a given day. Mm -hmm. And your most important job, learn your lesson, but then you need to observe and watch the children throughout the class. So you have to have your kind of teaching brain, but also your watching brain because the teacher, the children will tell you what they need. Mm -hmm. All behavior is a form of communication. They can't tell you, I'm a little bit bored. I'm a little bit hyper. I'm a little bit whatever it is, but their behavior will tell you that. And then it's your job to make it a successful class for them. Okay. It's not yeah. forcing them into a forcing them into a behavior. It's taking their behavior and incorporating that into what you're doing so that everybody feels successful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Um, so kind of adding on to that, learning from children, what are some of your favorite moments um, with young children or some of the most valuable lessons you've learned? Well, you know, as I mentioned, I learned the value of preparation. Yeah. And all you have to do is not be totally prepared and the children will let you know you're not yeah. totally prepared. So being prepared is the most important thing because then once you've got your lesson kind of there, then you're able to be open and available to read what's going on in the class and adjust because your lesson never goes as you planned. Right. The lesson goes as it meets the children and their behaviors and how they are um, that day. Mm -hmm. I talked about the role being an observer so you can do that and the children will teach you. You just have to be open to it. And going back to that Montessori teacher, respect is the big R and you need to respect everyone in your class, the children, the parents, everybody. Everybody is doing the best they can. Yeah. This is not my job to force them into a mold, but it's my job to let them unfold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, you've touched on this before and talked about it, um, but if you had to summarize it maybe, what would you say is the main principle of kinder music? I would say there are three prongs to the kinder music approach. One is using music to enhance child development. The second is providing parent support and education and connection. And the third is training masterful teachers. Okay. Do you have a favorite part of those three prongs or do you enjoy the whole process? So if, if I were to have a Venn diagram of three circ overlapping circles, mm -hmm. my favorite place is right in the middle, right? Uh -huh. Where you're um, dealing with child development, with parent education and masterful teaching. It's that's the sweet spot, yeah, right? All of it, yeah. okay. So um, obviously you enjoy kinder music very much. Um, what personality traits do you think um, would help someone be the most successful in kinder music or what skills would be the most useful in this type of career? I would say in any career, there are two things that are essential. Passion for that career and mm -hmm. authenticity. You can't fake it, especially yeah with young children. Mm -hmm. Children can sense somebody who isn't being sincere a mile yeah. away. So being authentic, being sincere um, are, are, I think, the most important things and being passionate about what you do. And that goes along with 
authenticity, I believe. Yeah. I think the other part of it is to have an ongoing love of learning, lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. Children today are very different than children were 40 years ago. So unless I'm willing to be open to learning constantly, I will never, I will not continue to be effective as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, so the next one is, since you were the director of education, which is a very big role in the kinder music organization, could you talk a little bit about what the business side of the music um, industry is? So how does the kinder music system work? How do like branches get established? So um, kinder music chose not to be a franchise model. Mm -hmm. Typically in a franchise model, there's a big um, investment that you make okay. at the beginning knowing that probably the people who are interested in teaching kinder music may not have deep pockets mm -hmm. to invest in something like that we very much wanted to attract those people maybe who were even part-time at first you know might be a, a choir director or a violin yeah. teacher and want to do this as well. So we wanted to make the, um, the investment reasonable um, mm -hmm. and accessible to, to folks to get started and not make it outrageous so that yeah. you couldn't even consider it. Um, so we have a license program where you do the training and you use the materials because we want kinder music to have a standard um, all <laughs> around the world that it means something to do um, to do kinder music, even though every teacher is a little bit different. There are standards we have to uphold to represent kinder music. Mm -hmm. um, so so we want people, we want to attract people who love children and love music. And they yeah. want to make this um, their career or part of their career. Mm -hmm. um, Kinder Music International provides a lot of marketing and, and um, business tools to help you get started because we understand that when you come out of school with a music degree, you don't necessarily have a business degree yeah. right alongside of it. So mm -hmm. we want to make that as easy as possible. That doesn't mean you, you don't have to learn about marketing and business practices and things like that. But Kinder Music International makes that easier. That's so wonderful that you're making it accessible to everybody that wants to be a part of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're getting to the final question, which is, do you have any advice for younger students that are interested in this career path? So maybe middle school or high school kids? Sure. Well, connect with a kinder music teacher in your area, just like you have with mm -hmm. Lindsay, either a teacher you had once with kinder music or just somebody who might be close by. Observe. Um, intern. Ask. Yeah you know, ask if you can um, watch and then eventually say, oh, could I lead a, an activity or something like get mm -hmm. your, put your toes in the water a little bit. Learn about children. And you can do a lot of that by observing um, a kinder music class. Um, also, you know, learn what it takes to, to run a business. There are lots of resources for that. Um, know that there's the potential for great joy. I think of, I remember a lot of my, my colleagues, not kinder music colleagues, but mm -hmm. my um, friends who taught in public schools. And I remember as they were approaching however many years, they were counting the days till they could retire. Mm -hmm. I've never done that. In fact, I haven't retired really yeah. yet. And isn't that the kind of job you want? 
a job is that you really that you love. Just yeah. really don't ever want to retire um, because you know it brings you joy, but you also know that you're making a big difference in the lives of these children and their families. Yeah. What what could be better? I don't know. I don't I know. Agree. I'm sure there are other things that people are equally passionate about, mm -hmm. but I'm thrilled that my love of music and my love of teaching and my love of children all came together with Kinder Music. Yeah. And I've spent 45 years loving it yeah yeah it really seems like such a rewarding career yeah well we look forward to welcoming you lucy oh. as a kinder music educator one day yeah not quite old enough yet but you will be mm -hmm. and you've future, got a good maybe. mentor close by yeah yeah miss Lindsay is super kind and so are you for everything